Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Eternal and all-merciful God, with all the angels and all the saints, we laud your majesty and might. By the resurrection of your Son, show yourself to us and inspire us to follow Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Psalm 30, please read responsibly. The assembly's portion is in bold print. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you restored me to health. 
You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful. Give thanks in holy remembrance. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. While I felt secure, I said I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with favor made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with my Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. O Lord, be my helper. You, you have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. The vision of John recorded in Revelation offers a glimpse of cosmic worship around the throne. At its center is the Lamb who was slain. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full force. Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Word of God, word of life. Amen. Reading from the gospel this morning, it's a long one, and so you may stay seated. John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know who he was. Jesus said to them, children, have you no fish? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging in the net full of fish. For they were not far away from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal, charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and he took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. 
This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. <laughs> Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter answered, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Again he said to him, the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, Jesus said to them, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. I would like to invite all of the children, parents, if you would like to come, older people, if you would like to come to the prayer ground, which I finally learned to say once, wait, say right, because they used to call it the playground. We're going to pray. Come on down. Hi. So I know this gospel you probably didn't hear about the fish, right? Jesus said to the disciples to bring the fish in his boat to them, and there was 153 fish. Now, the, who fishes? Do any of you guys fish? I know there's people out there that fish. These fish were seven, I looked it up, they were seven to eight inches long, and they each weighed one pound. So how many rows of Pews, do you think the fish would take? One? Two? Oh, I got a three over there. I think that's how old he is. <laughs> It'd take a lot of pews, wouldn't it, to do that many fish? Well, we don't have a boat here, but we can go fishing. And if you all will look at me for a minute. Hello? We're going to go fishing. So you need to grab a fishing pole, pretend. Now, yeah? everybody got their fishing pole? This is a song that I learned when I was a little, little girl, and you can tell that that was a long, long time ago. It's called, I Will Make You Fishers and Men. If any of you in the congregation know the song, please join us. I'll probably sing so low that we won't be able to sing. All right. Where does your pole go when you're going fishing? When you're walking there, it goes over your, your shoulder, right? I never go fishing, I just guess. And so, the first words of the song are, I will make you fishers and men. Are we ready? And when you say fishers and men, you have to throw your rod out so you can catch a fish, okay? Ready? I will make you fishers and men. Fishers of men, fishers of men, I will make you fishers of men. And Jesus says, if you follow me, if you follow me, if you follow me, 
I will make you fishers and men if you follow me. Who do you think Jesus is asking us to fish for? You? No? Those people out there? The people beyond our doors? When we see them? Yeah. Jesus is asking us to go out and fish for people. Now, wouldn't that be funny if you caught a person on the end of your line? Uh-oh. All right. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. Repeat after me. Jesus, we love you. Help us to go out in your world and do what you said, follow you. Help us to go out in your world and do what you ask, follow you. In Jesus' name. And how does Pastor Chris say? Amen. Thank you. Let us pray a prayer by Richard Rohr. God, Lord of all creation, lover of life and of everything, please help us to love in our own very small way what you love infinitely and everywhere. We thank you that we can offer just this one prayer and that will be more than enough because in reality, everything and everyone is connected and nothing stands alone. Amen. A little note, uh, we had a little trouble with our boards this morning, but thanks to a lot of people here, it came together. But if you hear every once in a while a little noise, that's not me. on the beach with Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's catch up with Jesus and the disciples. It's rainy and gloomy here and we're waiting for spring, but it'll come. But it's nice and sunny where Jesus and the disciples are on that beach by the Sea of Galilee. So let's rest with them for a while. Just to catch up on the story, after Jesus died, the disciples hid in a room, an upper room, for fear that the authorities would come after them as they had gone after Jesus. Peter, Peter the fisherman, finally becomes tired of being in a room because he's used to being outside. He's a fisherman. He fishes for a living. That's what he does. So he leaves the room, and it so happens often when one person gets the courage to leave the room, the others follow them. They thought, if Peter can do this, we can do it too, and we'll walk through our fear of what might happen. After all, it's night. And who's going to see us? Can you imagine them walking quietly down to the beach to the boat and perhaps whispering to each other or hushing one another so no one would hear them? Once there, they climbed in the boat and headed out to the water to fish. And they fish all night and do not catch a single fish, not one fish. Now, I was curious because I think there's a law against fishing at night. Now, I'm not sure. So I looked it up to see why they were fishing at night, and this is what I learned. 
that they went out to fish at night because all the fish were sleeping, and then they waited for the dawn when the fish rose to the top of the water and they could catch them because they were catching wood nets. I don't know if that's how it works today, but that's how it worked then. Oddly enough, though, as I said, they didn't catch any fish. So they head back to shore, and they see this person standing on the beach. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know he was Jesus. And Jesus asks children, have they caught any fish? And they say no, probably embarrassed because, you know, they're fishermen and they ought to be able to catch fish. And Jesus says, children, do you have any fish? Now, children, and that's what the Greek says, it's para, children is a response telling the disciples that this stranger whom they have not yet realized is Jesus is Jesus. You wouldn't call a big fisherman like Peter a child unless you really knew him because you might get crowned. Jesus. Jesus. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that, he jumped out of the boat and waded to the beach because they were by then not that far off. While the other disciples brought the boat with the catch because they had finally caught fish, 153 fish, and brought the boat in to shore. And Jesus had a charcoal fire going, and he says, bring me some of the fish you've just caught. And they come to Jesus, and they probably all sit in a circle around the fire, and Jesus took bread, gave it to them, then took the fish and also gave it to them to eat. So they sat with Jesus eating breakfast on the beach. It's such an extraordinary story. Why breakfast on the beach? Why isn't Jesus out in the hills and valleys of Judea teaching people about his love for them the more that hear it? the more they can believe in Jesus. Why isn't Jesus someplace else important like the temple or in Rome telling Caesar? Why the beach with just his disciples? After all, before he died and was raised, he fed 5,000 people with a couple of fish and a piece or two of bread. That must have been an awesome feast, something to remember, something to tell your family, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your friends. Do you know what Jesus did one day when he was still with us? Yet, in our gospel today, Jesus feeds only seven people from a catch of 153 fish. Doesn't seem like a miracle, not much of a miracle, compared to the feeding of 5,000 or the changing of water into wine? Why does the presence of Jesus and the disciples having breakfast on the beach matter for John, the gospel writer? Why does it matter for you and me? When I was an internship in Oak Oklahoma a long, long, long time ago, I visited a woman who was housebound. She couldn't leave her house for various reasons. And after some conversation, she said, I can't come to church anymore to be with Jesus. What a sad statement. And I said, 
Jesus is here. When you do the dishes, when you sleep, when you make coffee, Jesus is with you every step of the day because that's how it is with Jesus. All things with Jesus are holy. As I left that day, she thanked me for telling her that. And in my uh, internship, when I was younger and didn't know very much, I thought everybody knew that, that all things are holy wherever we are, whatever we do. Teresa of Avila, a Spanish nun, one of the great mystics and religious women of the Roman Catholic Church, wrote these words. We need Jesus in the kitchen, amid the pots and pans. We need a Jesus on the beach at breakfast time and at our work, in the car with us and while shopping. We need Jesus who goes with us on our everyday journeys. When we meet people, we need this Jesus. We need to remember that this Jesus who speaks into the times and places where we live and work, who is always present in our lives, making all things holy. All people holy, all things holy. In the prologue to his gospel, John writes words that we often use during the Sundays of Christmas. From John 1, hear his words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things, all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. Life. And that life was the light of humanity, all grounded in the word becoming flesh, all grounded in Jesus, who walks with us and talks with us and tells us he is our own. All of the gospel stories from all of the gospels after the resurrection tell of the simple, ordinary things Jesus did. Walking on the road to Emmaus with a stranger, roasting fish for breakfast on the beach, or looking like a gardener to Mary Magdalene. Jesus teaches us that God's presence can be seen in ordinary, common things, like bread and wine like bread and fish, like that first dandelion that Pastor Chris saw on the south side of the church, like the rabbit that rested under my office window the other day, like you name it. You put your words there. We encounter Jesus all the days, every day, every minute of the day in our lives. This morning, Jesus reminds us in a bit of bread and a sip of wine when we celebrate the holiness of communion. And then he reminds us that when we turn from the table, he said, follow me. Follow me out into the ways and byways of your life. Follow me where I lead you to those who need to see and know the love of Jesus. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Jesus asked each of us, do you love me? The world needs your love, Jesus' love to share. I found this song and I asked Tom if he would play and sing it and he graciously agreed before I sent it to him. 
It's a song by a woman named Carrie Underwood. It's a Christian song, and she writes this song. Part of the song that caught me was, I believe in jars of jelly put up by careful hands. And I had to laugh when I read that line because my mom made apple jelly when I was about 10 and we lived in the country, and it was beautiful. And she was so proud of herself that we couldn't tell her that when we opened the jars it was like glue. I believe in jars of jelly and people trying to make jelly. I believe most folks are doing just about the best they can. And I know there are some things that I will never understand. I believe in a good strong cup of ginger tea and that all these shoots and ropes roots will become a tree. All I know is I can't help but see all of this so very holy. Amen.
Let us stand and affirm our faith by our beliefs. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Christ is risen. Let us, let us share the peace. Today's broadcast, WKLKAM radio, and stream on the WKLK website, is brought to you by our Savior's Mission Endowment Fund, expanding mission beyond our walls since 1993. Thank you to all who donated Easter lilies in our sanctuary. Take them home if you haven't yet or to a loved one, please. They're getting a little odor, odorful, smelly. <laughs> they will be soon sent to compost, uh, compost. Otherwise, you can pick them up. Maybe you can make them come back to smelling good. Thank you for your support in many and various ways, including your financial support, all your gifts will be blessed a moment in the prayers. Now there's going to be a ministry moment. We're going to explore in these weeks following of May, our ministry trees live, how our ministry teams live out our, our Savior's shared values. I didn't write that. Here is... Rick Kirkova to from I didn't write that either from Palanca Deacons. Hello, Rich. Hello. You can stand right there. <laughs> All right. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Rich Kirkova, and this morning I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, Palanca Deacons, one of the ministry teams of our congregation. Uh, Palanca Deacons needs your help and your participation. Um, during the pandemic, uh, participation on our team dwindled somewhat. And now is the time to kind of get the word out 
about our team and in future weeks other teams um, and build this valuable team up again. So let me tell you just a little bit about what Palanca Deacons does. The word deacon comes from a Greek word that simply means servant or helper. And the word palanca is a Spanish word that means lever. You know, like a tool that you use to lift something that would uh, otherwise be hard to lift. The primary activity of our team is to serve as a confidential prayer group. Uh, people may communicate prayer concerns to us, and we lift those concerns up in prayer during our meetings and alone in our personal prayer lives. So our Palanca deacons leverage the power of prayer to serve others. We also serve as helpers in a couple other ways. Uh, we help by coordinating uh, the servers for Holy Communion and by coordinating the readers uh, during worship services. And we also spend time studying the gospel lesson each week with the pastors, and we get to hear their thoughts and ideas, share our own thoughts, and gain uh, some nifty insights into the upcoming sermons. Who can serve on Palanca Deacons? What are the qualifications? If you are a member of our congregation and you can pray uh, and you can hold the prayer concerns of others in confidence, you can be a Palanca Deacon. And when I say, can you pray, I don't mean can you make it sound fancy and, and, uh, and use big words and all that kind of stuff. You, if you can pray, like you pray at home, like you pray in the car, and you, you pray before bed, there's, there's no expectations about, uh, about, about uh, language or being fancy or anything like that. Um, when do we meet? Our group meets on Wednesday evenings at uh, 5 o'clock. And during a typical meeting, uh, we conduct any team business that we might have and update our list of prayer concerns. And then we spend time in prayer together, uh, praying for each of the items on the list. Then we read through the gospel lesson for the upcoming Sunday, uh, discuss it with the pastors, and we learn together. So what are the benefits of being a Palanca deacon? Um, what, what does it do for you? The power of prayer is huge. Um, that, by being intentional in your prayer practices, you know, praying regularly at home and as a group, uh, you are sure to enhance your relationship with God, as well as your relationship with your other deacons and your relationship with your larger church family. Personal experiences within deacons uh, include being privileged to pray for and support others who are going through hard times, celebrating and offering thanksgiving for those who have been blessed with great blessings, um, and being supported yourself uh, by your Christian family. I have served on this team at various times in my own personal journey, and in my times on deacons, I have been supported by prayer from others during some of the most painful moments of my life, uh, including the deaths of my mother and father, um, struggles in my personal family life. I have them too. <laughs> uh, and even in just day-to-day -day life stresses. Uh, because of my participation on this team, I can truly say that I love my church family. I can say that I need my church family, and I can say that I have grown in my faith in ways that I would never have foreseen. What's the commitment? Um, in an effort to increase participation on, on our team, uh, we have decreased the time commitment. Uh, it used to be that you would agree to serve a three-year term, and that in today's hectic world is kind of hard to ask of people. So we are, we are saying now that if you would agree to serve a one-year term, and then you would have the opportunity to re-up and, and serve longer should you desire. Um, we really want to open up the experience of being a Palanca deacon to as many people as possible because it enriches and strengthens our whole church. Um, if you are interested in serving or learning more, please don't hesitate to contact me personally um, or contact the church office if you don't know how to find me. 
Um, I would love for you to come and sit in on a meeting, uh, see how it works, uh, see if it would be a good experience for you. So please pray about this. Um, see if the Lord is calling you to serve our family in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Let us pray for the whole people of God and for all people in their need. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Living God, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign. You welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal and show us your wounded and risen body that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. God, in your mercy. Amen. Holy One of new beginnings, fill us with new life. Send us into the world as you sent your apostles to invite people to come and see your wondrous acts in Christ. God, in your mercy, Amen. revive ecosystems along coastlines that have been devastated by natural forces and human negligence. Reestablish plant and animal life that purifies air and water and that feeds humans and other living creatures. God, in your mercy, Amen. accompany laborers who give rest from their work, who get little rest from their work. Give them hope when they struggle to produce what they need, especially in these times of drought. Give all who labor fair treatment and just wages. God, in your mercy, Restore all people who cry to you for help, including those we name in our hearts before you now. Turn their mourning into dancing, clothe them with joy, and put a testimony of healing and praise on their lips. God, in your mercy, be present to the faithful ones who are persecuted for following you. Sustain them by your faithfulness and give them strength in the name of Jesus. God, in your mercy. Bless, O oh day, bless this day, O oh God, our offerings that we give to you in our money, in our song, in our words, in our presence. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Join our voices with angels and creatures in all saints in praising Christ and bestowing upon him all blessing and honor and glory. Reveal Christ's glory to us through us in our worship. God, in your mercy, please stand for the Lord's Prayer. In your mercy, O oh God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit for the sake of Jesus Christ who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare to hear and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, who gave us this holy supper, hear us, O Lord.
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Bonds to the love of our Creator, and remembering the death and resurrection of Jesus our Savior, we come to the table. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. Following our Lord's command and responding to our need for forgiveness, we come. Please be seated. The risen Christ dwells with us here, all who are hungry, all who are thirsty. Please come. Communion is continuous. Follow the directions of your ushers. Um, children, please let us know if you want them to commune, or we have fish to represent Jesus. Let us commune.
tasted the new heaven and earth where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. I um, am asked to remind you that the funeral banner is for Trudy Stahl, who passed recently. Please keep the family in your hearts. Thank you. Receive the blessing. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Amen.